month, we've explored many facets of human connection. Uh, being the good Unitarian Universalists that we are, we've used covenant as the lens for that discussion. We started with a review of how covenants have kept us in right relationship with one another, even when we've needed to go our separate ways. Then we looked at the fraught history of how our religious tradition has treated the black community. I suppose we can call that a kind of false covenant, but one that we're trying to fulfill today. And now we come to the subject of broken covenants. I want to just take a second. There is no such thing as a black community. The black community, the black people are not a monolith. I'm sorry, that's not what I meant to say. Black people is what I meant to say. So our religious traditions, history is fraught with black people because white people say dumb stuff like black community. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so covenants are promises that we make to each other about how we will behave. We need covenants because, as you might remember from a few weeks ago, people are annoying. <laughs> In order for us to make space for each other, we must limit ourselves in some ways. Perhaps the best illustration that I've heard of this balance was during a freshman survey course on American history, the kind where there were 200 people in the lecture hall and most of them were reading the newspaper because I'm that old, there were not phones then. <laughs> the professor was lecturing about the limits of liberty and he said, do I, as an American citizen, have the right to do this? And we all giggled and nodded our heads and said, yes. And then he said, okay, so do I have the right to do this? And he jumped off the stage and did this all over the lecture hall, knocking those newspapers right out of people's hands. <laughs> and his point was well made. We can technically do whatever we want, but if we want to have a functional society, we must be willing to limit ourselves in certain ways. Covenants are mutually binding agreements made by groups, made together. Everyone makes them instead of them being imposed upon you. Those of us who live within a set of covenants have consented to the limitations that they put forth. This is what we just did with our new members. The Unitarian Universalist congregations focus on covenants for several reasons, but one of them is because they hold us together in the absence of a creedal statement. We are not unified in our beliefs, we are unified in our commitments to each other. The end point of Unitarian Universalism is a world made whole through living fully in right relationships at all times. We don't currently live in that world. We live in a world where we mess up. All of us mess up all of the time. So what do we do when our covenants are broken? We have to find a way to recovenant with each other. In extreme cases of a broken covenant where there has been a pattern of abuse <coughs> or intimidation, the only way to be in right relationship is to remove the perpetrator from the group. That is really painful and it is an extreme solution, but it can be necessary when there is a concern about safety or the health of the rest of the group. I wouldn't call that the end of covenant, but rather the creation of a new covenant. And we always hope that that person can be brought back into community, into the original covenant. That is the least common solution to a broken covenant. It's extreme. A more common solution is an adjustment to the covenant. A broken covenant can bring to light something that was missing from the original covenant and needs to be explicitly written. Also, sometimes a broken covenant causes people to need different things from each other. That's often due to a loss of trust or a continuing wound. So the original covenant is amended with the consent of all of the appropriate parties. But what is the most common outcome when covenants are broken? 
is forgiveness and recommitting to the original covenant without having to make any adjustments. Usually it's not the covenant that needs adjusting so much as the behavior of the people within the covenant. The late Jewish philosopher Martin Buber once wrote, man is the promise-making, promise-keeping, promise-breaking, promise-renewing creature. It's just our nature to make promises with the best of intentions, to keep them for a little bit, and then eventually break them and need to renew them. Of course, renewing our covenants, our promises to each other, is um, easier said than done. I, I love ancient texts that feel like they could have been written last week. Um, that's particularly true of the texts that have to do with how to get along with one another because people have always been annoying. <laughs> so the passage that I share with you, uh, Matthew 18, 12 through 22 from the Christian scriptures is one such gem. I just absolutely love this passage. Jesus has been teaching and working, walking all over Palestine. He and his disciples finally spend a few days in one place, and what do they do? The disciples start bickering with one another about who's going to get the most in heaven. Like little kids fighting about who their grandparents love the most, or who's going to get the most candy. And Jesus tells them, it's, it's not really like that, guys. He tells a series of stories to illustrate the social structure that he's trying to create. Now, usually when Jesus talks about heaven, he's actually talking about the world uh, made whole rather than the afterlife. Like what things would be like if people could just get it right. And with the story of the lost sheep, he's attempting to make it clear that his ministry is not about being the best, being the most well-behaved, doing the right thing. Everyone is going to mess up. Everyone is going to be that lost sheep. And when you do mess up, you just get brought back. And everyone is glad that you came back. There's no shaming the sheep that got lost. There was no telling that sheep that it had to go sit in the corner. Or it only can eat whatever the sheep version of gruel is for the next week. It didn't do that. No, the sheep is just brought back. And the shepherd is just glad to have it back. Safe and sound. And that's it. This passage is often interpreted to mean that God is the shepherd, or that Jesus perhaps understood to be God as the shepherd, but it doesn't actually say that. Even in a more traditional translation of the texts, what it says about God is that God is pleased when the sheep is brought back, not that God is the one who brings the sheep back. And the story about this sheep is immediately followed by a teaching about resolving church conflict. Jesus says if someone hurts you, go talk to them directly, not go talk to five other people about what happened. And if that person won't hear you when you talk to them directly, take another person or two along with you as observers. The message translation that I shared says that the observers are there to keep things honest. The New Revised Standard Version says to confirm what was said. They're meant to be witnesses to the dynamics between the perpetrator and the aggrieved. They can notice things that the people in the heat of the disagreement might not notice. And if the perpetrator still refuses to be held accountable, that person is brought before the church. And if after all of that they still won't take responsibility for what they did, the church is responsible for starting their spiritual training all over from the beginning. The more traditional interpretation says to treat them as a tax collector or a Gentile, which does not mean an outcast. It means a person who doesn't know what church is about. They have to start over and tell them everything about what church is from the very beginning, as if they've never heard it, with an open heart, full of love and grace. And then immediately, brash, impulsive, deeply relatable, captain of team too much, Simon Peter blurts out, but how many times must we forgive somebody? Seven? As if seven is the biggest, most generous number that he can think of. And Jesus says, no, Peter, try 70 times seven. 
So a Bible pro tip here, numbers in the Bible often have an esoteric meaning, and 70 times 7 means infinity. You have to forgive somebody and walk them through this accountability process, re-covenant with them as many times as they need. You remember that story about the sheep from a few minutes ago? That story about the sheep is followed by this accountability process, which is followed by an instruction that it goes on forever. <coughs> so who brings back that lost sheep? Well, folks, we do. Our beloved community's covenant begins with the statement that we will assume best intentions. When one of us goes out of that covenant, we have lost our way, and it is our responsibility to bring that person back in. When someone here at BUC is out of covenant, we start with the baseline that they didn't know, that they didn't understand, they didn't mean to, best intentions. They wandered off, and now it's our job to go get them. And how do we bring them back? Start with that one-on-one -on -one conversation. Hey, so something happened, and I don't feel good about it. Can we talk about that? And if they won't hear you, if they won't be held accountable, I really do honestly believe that you try again with a friend or two, maybe somebody who was there and saw the original event. Ask them to listen to the conversation between you and the person who hurt you, and they might find that your assessment is off. And then all you have to do is apologize and move on. But if they don't listen to you, um, please do not bring them in front of the whole church. <laughs> that, is, that is not the next step for us. <laughs> the Bible passage was written in the context of the church being small meetings where everybody was like a family meeting in someone's house. In our context, that would not be the time. Please do not try to use joys and sorrows for that. <laughs> so, it's not what we're here to do. So in our church, the next step would be to see somebody from the committee on ministry or to talk to me. We can help sort it out from there. And our goal is always to restore our covenantal relationships and bring wholeness back to our congregation. If there is a broken relationship between two of you, or two of you, two of you or more are gathered, if that's broken, then we're all broken. We have to be able to be okay. When teaching about forgiveness in sacred community, Jesus told Peter that he had to forgive each other times infinity. When I was a kid, we say times infinity to the infinite power plus infinity. <laughs> what Jesus meant is forgiveness is a process that is never done. That's why it goes to infinity. The world made perfect, this congregation made perfect, where covenants are primary and we all live in right relationship with each other all of the time is an aspirational goal. We aspire to it, knowing that we can't really do it in this lifetime, but we keep on aspiring to it anyway. Our ability to forgive will always come up short. Our ability to stay in covenant will come up short. Other people's ability to stay in covenant will come up short. But we do it anyway. Maybe our endpoint, the UU vision of a world made fair, is not about total compliance with covenants. It's not about the sheep who never strays. It's about total commitment to getting back into the covenant, coming back. We persevere in this infinity forgiveness process. Because forgiving someone 